Um, we'll start with some introductions and then we'll get into the program. Um, my name is Ozi Alozium. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a dark skinned black woman. I'm wearing a green head wrap, um, a white long sleeved turtleneck um, underneath a yellow polka dot, white and polka dot jumpsuit. I've got on pink glasses. Um, I've got on Saturn earrings with fresh, plus, fresh flowers that are preserved in them. And I'm sitting in front of a white wall with about six plants behind me. Um, I start with visual introductions because I don't want to assume uh, how people are ex how, how people are interacting or accessing the space. And I'm trying to do my best to move um, more from a place of a practice, a praxis of accessibility. Um, do I always do that the best? Not always, um, but I am struggling and striving in that direction. So we do have closed captioning available. Um, something fell through with our ASL interpreter, so we do not have that, unfortunately. And my apologies to folks who, um, who, are, who are wanting that, that offering. Um, definitely we'll do better in the future to make sure that that is available as well. Um, yeah, we're honored here to have Dr. Gail Parker with us, who's the author of Restorative Yoga for Ethnic and Race-Based Stress and Trauma. Um, this is what the book looks like. It is a really beautiful, soft cover with um, a portrait of a Black individual in child's pose laying on a blanket or pillow. Um, and we'll start with conversation with, with Dr. Gail, um, and she's going to share a bit about the book and her journey and the work that she does, and then we'll open it up to the other panelists who will share about the work that they do and how they've interacted with this book. Um, but I want to start by framing sort of where this conversation came to be um, and how this sort of happened. Uh, Jennifer Dewey, who is manning our tech, or not manning, managing our tech, I'm trying to use more gender uh, neutral language um, with Kat. We, Jennifer reached out to me and said, hey, we've got this book talk coming with Dr. Gil Parker. You do similar work. We would love to do a program around it. Um, and so me, Jen and I and met with Dr. Gil Parker and we were in conversation about how we saw this, this discussion, this um, book talk going. And through our conversation, it sort of expanded a bit and we thought it would be great. And by we, I selfishly was like, okay, you're really great. And I know these people in this community who have been interacting with your work in really amazing ways. It would be really, really great for those, those women that I know to be able to um, be in conversation and dialogue with you and with this text about how we can radically reimagine healing, um, specifically around racial stress and trauma. And so it evolved from a book talk to a panel discussion to a combination of the two, and we're very excited to be jumping into that. I encourage you all to check out the bios of the folks um, who are speaking. You can find that on the registration page, which I will link right now for those of you who might not have had the chance to do so. Um, I love all of the folks who've already shared where you're tuning in from, what your battery percentage is. Thank you for that. We'll try to engage you all as we continue this discussion today. Um, but before I sort of create space for uh, the panelists um, to introduce themselves outside of their bios, I do wanna start with a land acknowledgement. And so the Denver Public Library honors and acknowledges that the land on which we reside is the traditional territory of the Ute, Cheyenne and Arapaho peoples. We also recognize the 48 contemporary tribal nations that are historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. At this point, I'm sure many of you have seen land acknowledgements. They've been done in a myriad of ways. I think it's really important um, as part of my de decolonial practice to explain why we do land acknowledgements. Land acknowledgements are actually indigenous protocol. So meaning for indigenous peoples, it's important to locate where you stand, both geographically and ancestrally. So doing this, right, doing participating or lifting up land acknowledgements can be a way to honor this very important indigenous tradition. They also serve to interrupt our complicity um, and our participation in active genocide and indigenous erasure. Colonization is a current and ongoing process and we have to be, we have to be vigilant and mindful of our present participation in it. We've got to remember all of the things that we've done and what we've participated in um, so that we can move forward in a different direction, the direction of liberation and freedom. And so in October of last year, actually, our city council adopted a resolution that um, a land acknowledgement is going to now follow the Pledge of Allegiance at every city council meeting. And the text that I just read on the screen is a modified version of that. 
Um, what I really like about the version that they include, um, which I will read in a second, is that it also speaks to the current contributions of Indigenous folks in this community. And so I'll read the, the, longer, um, the longer land acknowledgement before moving on. So Denver Public Library honors and acknowledges that the land on which we reside is the traditional territory of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. We also recognize the 48 contemporary tribal nations that are historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. We honor elders past, present, and future, and those who have stewarded this land throughout generations. We also recognize that government, academic, and cultural inst institutions were founded upon and continue to enact exclusions and erasures of indigenous peoples. May this acknowledgement demonstrate a commitment to working to dismantle ongoing legacies of oppression and inequities and recognize the current and future contributions of indigenous communities in Denver. And I think this, is, this land acknowledgement is really important because it's not only talking about the single story of suffering, right? Um, and the genocide and the erasure um, and the harm that indigenous communities have experienced, right? In a past tense, it's talking about the current, the present, but also the, the beauty that comes with being indigenous and the contributions that these folks have made not only in this community, but across the world. And it's really important to lift up both, yes, the story of suffering so that we are aware of that and we can do our best to disrupt its continuance, but to make sure that we are also amplifying um, all of the positive contributions, all of the positive dimensions of being an indigenous person. Uh, so again, a land acknowledgement is just a start and it doesn't really mean anything if you don't put action behind it. If you haven't, I encourage you to take time to learn about the land that you are inhabiting, to learn about the people who first inhabited it, and then to make a commitment to doing something to disrupt that history. Land acknowledgements don't mean anything unless you're pairing that with action, whether that is actively participating in the amplification of indigenous voices, paying land taxes to local tribes, donating to indigenous groups, um, or to other folks that are doing the work to support those communities, making a commitment to doing something to actively disrupt that harm is, is fundamentally important. Um, and I will drop a link in the chat for folks who are wanting to learn more about um, where they are situated on. Um, again, this is just a jumping point to learn about um, your traditional territory or the traditional territories Use that as a jumping point, do your own research. You can use a library. The library's got a ton of, of uh, books and materials and folks who are interested in connecting you to history. Before I introduce the panelists, I do wanna start with some brief in invitations. I don't want to be really prescriptive here, but I do want to invite you all um, into the following things so that we're uh, sort of experiencing the space as um, bravely as we can and as um, engaged as we can. And so those invitations are to be present, right? I know that there's a lot of things happening and I am, I, I do it all the time where I'll sign up for a webinar and then I'll be like listening and trying to send emails and doing all these other things. But this conversation is so important and also I think requires a, a level of presence that isn't gonna be possible if you're trying to do other things. So try to minimize the tabs and be as present as you can. Um, practice wonder, wonder about the folks that you're going to be hearing from, wonder about yourself and what's coming up for you and your experience as you're hearing things. We're going to be doing um, some somatic, a brief somatic exercise after this, right after I finish with these introductions to invite you into your body. And I am going to invite you to stay in your body and to practice wondering about what is happening in your experience as you're engaged in this conversation and are taking in this information. I'm also going to ask you to listen generously, right, to, again, going back to that being present, to really be thinking about and listening to what people are saying and not necessarily in order to um, respond or to, to connect it to other things, but just really being present and what's being shared. Um, check in with yourself, take care of yourself. If you feel triggered by anything in particular, or if you decide that this isn't the space that you need to be in right now, definitely do what you need to be able to, to be here as safely as you can for yourself. Um, and be willing to learn, to grow, to feel, to change, to be moved. Um, I think that we assume a certain level of psychological safety in conversations like this, and that's not always the case. Um, 
especially for folks who haven't practiced vulnerability or haven't participated in similar discussions. And so I'm inviting you as safely as you can again to, to be willing to learn, to be willing to be moved, to be willing to feel and to change. Okay. Um, and with that, then I'm going to now segue into our panelist introductions. Um, we've got a wonderful group of Black women here who are doing such dope work. Um, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves rather than me reading through their bio. And I'm going to invite folks to do it through the following way. I would like you to say, as and I would also invite you to offer visual introductions or descriptions of yourself, but to say, who are you? What do you do? And who are your people? And so I will model that. Who are you? My full name is actually Ozima and Kechi Elosium. Ozima means good news. Um, and Kechi means God's gift or gift from God. And Elosium is my great great grandfather's first name. Um, and that's also tied into who I am. I am Igbo. Um, I am indigenous to uh, Igbo land, which is a region of Southeast Nigeria, which is where my ancestral homes still reside and where all of my family outside of my siblings and my parents currently live. Um, and so that's an important part of me, that, that indigeneity, but also that connection to Nigerian culture. Um, as well as I, I think I'm connected to people who are also connected to, to healing, to justice work, to liberation work, and to education. Um, people that center connection in all that they do. Uh, and what do I do? I center connection in all that I do. I am a racial equity specialist and racial healing person. I work for the library, but I think if I had to summarize it, I do my best to spread um, soft yellow light, uh, which to me is spreading not only education and awareness, but spreading love for the sake of creating a world where we all can feel safe, seen, heard, respected, and held. Um, and to me, that feels like the color yellow in a lot of ways. Um, and so that's what I, I say that I do. I promote the color yellow in the work that I do. And I love doing that. So I will hand it over to Dr. Gail, um, if you would like to go next. And then we can just go uh, to the rest of the folks. And I'll make sure that I'm spotlighting our panelists. Well, hello, everybody. I happen to be in uh, Detroit, Michigan. And Michigan is the land of the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi uh, uh, Native Americans. Um, and so I'm really happy to be here with you. That was an intimidating <laughs> introduction, Ozzy, and I don't know, I don't have all of that prepared uh, to share uh, with all of you. Uh, my visual introduction would be, I am a, a light-skinned African-American woman. And for those of you who can see my background, which is sort of a caramel color, I'm about the same color as the background I'm in. Uh, so, so you may not see a lot of contrast. Um, I have a big smile on my face because I'm really, really excited and happy to be here, especially with young folks who are doing work that I did a million years ago. Uh, you're calling it DEI work now, diversity, equity, and inclusion work. We used to call it diversity training um, many, many years ago. And I love the um, how you're stepping up and how you're really speaking out and how you are uh, just very clear about what needs to be done and acknowledgements and et cetera. So I'm, I'm happy about that. I'm happy to hear that. Who am I? Um, well, gosh, I, as a psychologist, by the way, in the old days, uh, uh, during the humanistic psychology movement, we used to have to, we used to go to workshops and they would ask that question, who are you? And you'd have to look meaningfully into somebody's eyes and it, try to answer the question. And then, but, but no, but who are you? Well, I'm Gail. Well, no, but who are you? Well, I'm a mother. No, but who are you? Uh, well, I'm uh, a psychologist, I'm an author, I'm, uh, you know, a, a lifelong practitioner of yoga. Yes, but who are you? And it would just narrow down and narrow down and narrow down until the answer is, I don't have a clue. I don't have a clue. And I think that that's an important starting place. Who am I? I don't know, fundamentally, really, who, what, it, what is all of that, all of the titles and all of the things that we do, we attach to that. And, and to some extent, that's who we are. But fundamentally, we are, I, I guess I would say that I am a spiritual being having a human experience. And, and that's how I see all of you as well. Um, 
my people, who are my people, one of the things and one of the reasons I wrote this book is that for African Americans, we don't know who we are. One of the one of the things that occurred is a, a <clears throat> is is a stripping of our identity. And it and, and I think that that's one of the deepest racial wounds that we have experienced. But fortunately, thanks to Nicole Hannah Jones, who wrote the 1619 Project we begin to realize, wait a minute, but we've, we've created and cultivated our own identity as African-Americans. We have, we have risen from the ashes and, and, and created our own culture, our own language, our own foods, our own customs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so even though I can't trace my ancestral roots all the way back to Africa, and obviously there's European uh, in, in clearly in me, although, my family, all the way back to my great grandparents, all identified as African American. And uh, I'll finish this up in a minute, but it reminds me of something my grandmother said, who looked like a white woman. She would say, Why, well, my dears, there's been no white blood in our family for years. And I remember asking my mother, Why does she say that? And she said, Well, because to admit to have white blood is to admit having been born of rape. And for that generation, that was humiliating. Well, um, Caroline Williams has written a beautiful op-ed in the New York Times saying, I am born of rape colored skin. And she talks about her ancestry. And she says, I have just as much right to talk about the, the white men who raped my ancestors as I do all the rest of my people. And she's, and, and I remember reading that, she wrote this about a year ago. I remember reading that and I felt liberated. I remember thinking, oh, this doesn't have to be a source of shame because I was raised to believe that it was. So um, having said that, I think that's enough. Don't you think? I'm, I'll, do, <laughs> I'll talk about the book, but that's about all I'm gonna say about me right now. That's perfect, thank you. I'm gonna bring Asia to the spotlight. Yes. <sighs> Dr. Parker coming through. <laughs> when she said rape color skin, I started crying uh, mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, OZ, thank you so much for setting that container and in the intentional and beautiful way that you do nearly everything. Um, I'm so happy to be here um, in a place that you've cultivated with all these beautiful humans. Um, if, you, if you cannot see me, I want you to um, I want you to hear what I feel like uh, today I should sound um, a little sorrowful. Uh, maybe you can hear the, the honey sweetness that's always there. Maybe, um, maybe I sound like some forest with some new growth that has just been burned down. Um, who am I? I, I am the granddaughter of Betty Jo. Um, I am the embodiment of love privilege. It's, I'm what it looks like walking in the world. Um, what do I do? I, um, what do I do? Uh, I hope that I create beauty. Um, I'm a nourishment based herbalist that centers this Colorado bioregion, um, I, I try to move and shape the world, but it's not always beautiful, but I'm striving for that. Um, I am an apprentice to the plants, but also um, I'm learning to be soil and I'm learning to humble myself uh, because I'm learning that I, <laughs> I am not a crone. <laughs> I am not, uh, I don't know all the things yet, but I do know what I know. Um, and so I'm a person who shares what she knows from her own experience. Um, Ozzy, I forgot the last question. Um, who are your people? Who are my people? Um, I don't know. My, I don't know. My people are the ones who choose to, to listen to the things that I say like there's gold falling out of my mouth. And uh, I always feel when my people are present and I know that my people are present, um, but my people have all sorts of different embodiments 
some that I wouldn't expect. And so I've had to dissolve a lot of conversations about race and gender and da 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 da, all the things, because I'm finding that my people um, exist without categories. So if you are my people, then you know that you are, and you know that I am yours. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm super, I'm super happy to be here today. Thank you, that was beautiful. I'm gonna bring in Dr. Zuleika Henderson. There you go. Hello, everybody. I am Zuleika Ruglo Clinton Henderson. I am on Lenape land here in New York, and I am the daughter of Damani and Takesha, the granddaughter of Ruvime, Gloria, and uh, Bud Owens. I am uh, the, a daughter of East New York, Brooklyn, and of the Bud Owens clan in Water Quarters in Alabama. I am the embodiment of my uh, elders' dreams. I am all of those things, and I am you all. I, um, in terms of what I do, I stand in a possibility that I listen to spirit to uh, declare for myself. So I, Zuleika Ruglo Henderson, am the possibility that all people of African ancestry will know that there are places for them to go to elevate joy and well-being and that there are sacred spaces to go to put, process, and transform their pain in service of personal and collective freedom. So that is you know, who I am, that is how I am. Uh, I'm also a social worker, a social work educator, but I borrowed the language of my ancestors to say that I am a fireside trainer. And that means that I intentionally uh, really gather the gifts, the jewels that we have been uh, given our original instructions and I make sure that those who are with me and those who are coming up beyond me have that wisdom. So my intention is to be sure to pass those uh, things along. And uh, who are my people? My people are all warriors for healing. Um, and uh, I forgot to start with visually describing myself. So I am uh, we grew up saying caramel, <laughs> but today uh, my melanin has been elevated by the kiss of the sun from spending time over the weekend uh, camping with my niece and my sisters and uh, laying out on Reese Beach. And uh, I have Afro-y hair <laughs> um, that I learned to create and mold during the pandemic. I have on red lipstick. I have uh, white triangular earrings and a pink and gold beaded necklace that is uh, draped over the black dress that I have on. And I have a white headphone uh, emerging from my right ear. Behind me, I have a green backdrop and a magenta orchid. Um, and yeah, I'm fully present and grateful to be here. What a juicy, delicious privilege and joy uh, to, to celebrate uh, today uh, in company together. So thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you. And last but not least, Jaleesa Williams is also in the house. I'm gonna put you on spotlight. There you go. Peace y'all, hi, hi. Um, we'll start off with some visual introductions. Um, I am, uh, I'm looking at this bag that's next to me that says cam, it's a camel colored bag and I feel like I could be camel colored, right? But that felt weird. So we work with that, okay? Um, and. Oh, we just, you muted yourself. Thank you, that's weird. Um, Beautiful. I have blonde locks. Uh, they are currently in some interesting twisted up style because it is hot um, and I don't like my hair on my neck during the summer. Um, I am wearing some like nice thin rim glasses. I have on some gold chains. I am wearing like a geometric printed top. Uh, we had headshots today, so I had to show out. Um, and I am, my backdrop is a bed a bed with some white sheets and a, uh, a yellow wallpaper. I am currently out in um, Northampton, Massachusetts, uh, where I am a lecturer uh, at Smith College uh, School of Social Work. 
um, which is what I just found out. So shout out to your link. I love learning things. I am on um, Nipmuc and Pocumtuck uh, territory at this time. Um, now for who I am, um, I like to say I'm the light, you know? Uh, I like to say that I definitely create, um, I create spaces, I create just a little bit of, hey, look this way, um, for my people, like I'm very, very big on that. Um, what do I do? Um, I like to transform. I'm really big on that. I love to transform. Um, I love to recreate. Um, and then I love to come back for my people and show them what I learned. Uh, during that transformation. Uh, that's a really big piece. I always say uh, Harriet Tubman is my like my number one idol because she left and she came back for her people, right? And I think there's something beautiful about that. Um, um, I am also a uh, professor. So I have been teaching out in Denver for a few years and now I'm doing some half-time, part-time stuff out in uh, Northampton um, and in Denver. I am also a clinician. So I am a, a licensed clinical social worker and I have a private practice called Yamaya Energy Therapeutics, where I focus on working with Black, Brown, Indigenous, uh, queer bodies on anxiety, depression, transition, um, ascension, right? Just all the good things that we need, the healing. Um, I'm also a researcher, so I do a lot in regards to uh, intergenerational Black healing, right? Like, I just I want to just make sure my people are good. Um, a lot on rest and ease and flow. Um, I, I talk about it and also I'm learning how to be that as well, how to embody that. And, and I love uh, being curious, right? So, uh, and then who are my people? Y'all my people, what you talking about? Y'all are here, y'all my people, right? Like I feel like people, my people are always around me. I'm covered always with beautiful things and beautiful conversations. and anyone that's interested in listening, interested in leaning, interested in learning and teaching, um, y'all my people. So I'm very happy to be here and connect and listen and lean. Um, oh, y'all so beautiful. So thank you, Ozzy. Y'all are so fire. Wow, what a, what a group of wonderful, beautiful human beings. I am so excited for this next hour. Um, so the way that this will go, we're going to do some, we're going to get into our body. So Dr. Gail Parker is going to get us into our bodies with a somatic exercise. And then she's going to share a bit about her book. I've got a few questions for her. And then we'll open it up to the rest of the panel to either ask Dr. Parker some more questions and engage with what they've learned or derived from the book, as well as some questions that I have for the group. And then hopefully there'll be time at the end for some Q&A. Um, so if you've got questions, definitely submit them. There are folks that are monitoring both the chat and the Q&A to make sure that we see those. Um, so without further ado, we're gonna, I'll hand it over to Dr. Gil Parker and we can get into our bodies even more so. Before we get into our bodies, I was reading the chat and somebody said, OMG, and this is just the introductions. <laughs> <laughs> so so this, this is going to be fun. We're going to have fun for the next hour. Um, so there's a very sweet greeting that, uh, that, that villagers who live in the northern desert of Cameroon use before they begin a conversation. And the greeting in the English translation of the greeting is, are you in your skin? And the traditional response is, I am alive and well and in my skin. My soul is in my body. And this is how they begin their conversations. So I'm going to facilitate us getting into our skin and experiencing our souls as being in our bodies. And then we will continue. So uh, have a seat and make sure that wherever you're sitting, Make sure that your back is supported. If you're sitting on the floor, sit next up, up against a wall. If you're in a chair, make sure your back is supported. Feet are planted firmly on the ground. If your legs are extended out, that's fine. Or if you want to lay down, that's acceptable as well. Just make sure you're comfortable because we're going to be here for a little bit. And close your eyes. Just lower your gaze. Close your eyes and take a deep inhale through your nose and exhale through your mouth. Another deep inhale through your nose, exhale through your mouth and feel yourself grounding. And one more deep inhale through your nose and exhale through your mouth. 
And then just begin to focus your awareness on your breath. Notice the coolness of breath as you inhale and the warmth of your breath, caressing your nostrils as you exhale. And then notice the expansion of your torso as you inhale and the contraction as you exhale, the hollowing out as you exhale. Just feel the swelling of breath through your belly into your lungs on your inhale and the hollowing out as you exhale from top to bottom. And just enjoy your breath. And then focus your awareness on the top of your right foot. And just feel whatever sensation is there. And then focus your awareness on your right big toe, your second toe, your third toe, your fourth toe, and your pinky toe. And then focus your awareness on the bottom of your right foot, your right ankle, your right calf, your right shin, your right knee, and your right thigh. Then shift your awareness to the top of your left foot, your left big toe, your left second toe, your third toe, your fourth toe, and your fifth toe. Then send your awareness to the bottom of your left foot, your left ankle, left calf, left shin, left knee, left thigh, left sit bone, right sit bone, right hip, left hip, your belly, your waist, your lower back, your middle back, your upper back. And then focus your awareness on your torso. your right shoulder, right upper arm, right elbow, right forearm, right wrist, the top of your right hand, your right thumb, right index finger, right middle finger, right ring finger, and right pinky finger. The palm of your right hand. And then shift your awareness to the palm of your left hand, 
left thumb, left index finger, left middle finger, left ring finger, left pinky finger, the top of your left hand, your left wrist, left forearm, left elbow, left upper arm, left shoulder, your collarbones, the back of your neck, the sides of your neck, the front of your neck, your jaw, your ears, your temples, your eyes, your forehead, and your scalp. And then let's take a deeper dive inside and focus your awareness on your brain. The inside of your mouth. your tongue, your esophagus, your lungs, your heart, your stomach, your diaphragm, your liver, your pancreas, your spleen, your kidneys, and your intestines. And then imagine that you are a dove. The head of the dove is joy. Your right wing is love. Your left wing is bliss. Your entire body is peace. And just envision that you are held in consciousness and rest here for a moment. And then bring your palms, the palms of your hands together in prayer position. And begin to vigorously rub the palms of your hands together, generating some heat. And very gently place the palms of your hands over your eyelids. And open your eyes into the warmth of the palms of your hands and just let the light filter through. And when your eyes have adjusted to the light, you can release the palms of your hands into your lap. Come back to your computer screen. And I will ask you, are you in your skin? I am alive and well and in my skin. My soul is in my body. And if you like, 
and feel so inspired, you can just write in the chat. You can pick one word that describes what you're experiencing right now and just put it in the chat. And here I'm in my skin, my soul is in my body. Healing, rest, joy, joy, feeling, peace, the same. Calmness, content, comfort, grateful. Ocean of love, centered peace, calm. See, isn't that nice? Yeah. So this is, this is something that we can do for ourselves anytime. This is always available to us to just check in and to center ourselves within ourselves, away from all of the distractions that pull us out of self, that take away from our own sense of our being, of who we are. Who am I? That's a really important question. So the yogis tell us, I'm, so this, this book, I, I, Ozzy wants me to tell you how the book came about. So before I start talking about the book, I will tell you that. Um, in 2012, I think it was 2012, uh, Trayvon Martin was murdered. And which was very disturbing to all of us. Um, and the fact that uh, uh, there was no conviction for the murder was even more disturbing. And so all of these things disturb our systems. They, di they disturb our psyche, they disturb our soul, they dis disturb our heart, they disturb our physiology, our psychology, our emotions in every way. Th 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 these are disturbing events. And uh, then in 2014, in 2014, I happened to be at a uh, yoga retreat with uh, someone that I learned for a lot, who teaches philosophy, yoga philosophy. And this is somebody that I've known for many years and, and have studied with for many years. And I was the only black person there as usual. And uh, the, the facilitator uh, was very upset by the murder of Michael Brown. It happened a few days, the retreat was about four days after Michael Brown was murdered. And he was indignant, he was angry, he was uh, very uh, upset about the event. And I looked around the room, there were about 50 of us in the room and I looked around the room and um, this is so, here's, here's my phone. So this is what I'm saying. I'm looking at people, looking at their phones kind of, you know, look at waiting for him to finish. And I remember thinking at that point, in that moment, I thought, you know what, this is my work. This is my work. It is time for me to step into this space and begin to share and educate us about the healing aspects of yoga and meditation traditions. Now, I'm a psychologist and was in private practice at the time. I had been pra private practice for over 45 years. When I closed my practice in 2015, uh, because the universe sort of arranged it so that I, it was time for me to do that. I, I wasn't doing it on my own, but my office flooded. It was, there was a big mess. Um, and someone said to me, has it occurred to you? I'm trying to figure out how to keep things going. And someone said, has it occurred to you to close the practice. And all of a sudden, the sense of calm came over me. And I thought, it's time to do that. And so I did, which allowed me to take a deeper dive into the healing aspects of yoga and meditation and, and thinking about ways to share that with our community. And so I was teaching at the time, I was teaching in medical schools and in a hospital, I was teaching in the only hospital-based yoga therapy program in the country at the time, uh, teaching yoga teachers who wanted to be yoga therapists how to use this as a therapeutic healing modality. I don't teach yoga. I teach, I educate people about how to use yoga and meditation as therapeutic modalities, all right. So I thought, well, let me just start taking a look because I noticed on Facebook that, that my young Facebook friends um, were really, really, really distraught and did not know how to manage what was going on at all emotionally. And I thought, well, you know, I've been around for a while. I've, we've been there, done that, bought that t-shirt. We have, we have seen this before. I know how to support people in maintaining 
a sense of self in maintaining um, a sense of well-being in the midst of these terrible events. I know how to do that. So I started taking a look at what was going on in behavioral health, not much, um, and nothing at all in the yoga community, which is a predominantly white community. And so I thought, okay, it's time for me to take a deep dive into this. And now I have time because I'm no longer in private practice. I can devote all of my attention to this. So one thing led to another and the International Association of Yoga Therapists found out what I was doing, heard about my work and asked me if I would make a presentation at their 95% white organization. And so it wasn't the audience that I was planning on speaking to, but again, the universe presented this to me. So I thought I started not to do it. I really, I, I, I just, I, I was reluctant because what I didn't want again was in my talk, people doing, you know, looking, being uninterested. Because that that is a deeper that's a that's a deep wound, you know, when 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 you're sharing your heart and your soul and the most important thing in the world to you, and people are not interested or don't appear to be or and all right. But my uh, my support system, my husband, my son, and my friends, but black and white said, no, you have to do this. You you tag your it. You, you got to do this. So I said, okay, I, I will. So I did. Well, it was so well received that they called me back the next and said, "We're not. You don't have to write a proposal this time. We want you to come back and and be the keynote speaker, and to do a workshop." I was afraid. I was afraid again to do it. You know, I really was. Why? Because the first chapter of this book is entitled "The Wounds Heal, But the Scars Still Hurt," and I reflect in that first a couple of paragraphs that I, I think part of my fear was I, I was afraid of what was gonna come up in me. I was afraid of reawakening these wounds in me that I had not, uh, you know, had to visit for a while. Um, and so I went, I, I went ahead and did this, but I, and I called the talk white as a color too. Why? It's a 95% white audience. And my thinking at that time, and this was in 2018, my thinking at that time was white people need to understand that they are just as negatively impacted by racism as we are. The perpetrators of these racist um, policies and the, the silence that is complicit in maintaining the status quo uh, and people who are unable to, I, I regard white fragility as, as an example of race-based traumatic stress, white people's race based right? You know, when you can't even have a conversation without breaking down or getting defensive or walking away from it, there's something wrong with that. That needs to be healed and taken care of as well. So this was not my intended audience, but I'm thinking this is the audience. So let me speak to th that particular audience. And so I did well. It was very well received. Um, it, I got a standing ovation. It was great. Actually, it was one of the best talks I've ever given. And um, an, a publisher approached me at that conference and said, would you write, you need to write a book on this. And I said, a book? I said, it's a 20 minute talk. They said, no, you need, it's a book. So I wrote a proposal, it was accepted, and the restorative yoga for ethnic and race-based stress and trauma was conceived. My intention in writing this book in the way that this book was written was to invite everyone who read the book to begin to identify what their own issues with their own race and ethnicity are. So our title, of this book talk is imagining, Ozzy, tell me, tell me what the title is again. Imagine, Radically reimagining. Reimagining. For racial stress and trauma. All right. And, and so it occurred to me as I was preparing for this talk that awareness is the medicine of healing. It's our awareness is the medicine of healing. That's how I reimagine 
healing race-based stress and trauma. I'm talking about for black people in particular. Um, and black and brown people who are, who are experiencing race-based stress and trauma. And so cultivating an awareness that I even am experiencing stress and trauma is critically important. Now in 2018, which was not that long ago, it may not surprise you to realize that people were, you know, when you, when you adapt and adjust to a racialized culture, you don't even know that you're stressed and traumatized by it. You, it's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. I remember John Lewis saying that his parents told him that when he was indignant about the segregated South and they said, well, it's just the way it is. Why don't you, it's, this is just the way it is. See? So when we adjust and adapt, we lose awareness of how we are being harmed. So I thought it was really important for us to start with that. What is my relationship to my own race and ethnicity? And I thought that for white people, it's really important for them not to try to help us, but to take a look at their own issues around their own race and their own ethnicity. In other words, what, is it, what does it mean to be white? What is that? What is that? Now, I can't tell you that because I'm not white. So that becomes your own internal self-exploration, self-study. Who am I? In answer to the question about one of, one of the ways to begin to ask, answer that question, who am I really in my whiteness, for example? But that's for another conversation, another group. Who am I in my blackness? You know, who, who am I? You know, what is that? So we heard some really rich answers to that question in our introductions today. So that was the original intent of the book. Um, so COVID hit, the book was supposed to be published, actually it was supposed to be published in June, 2021. I got it finished early. And so the publisher uh, said, well, it will be published in June, 2020. COVID hit and the publication date was changed to August, 2020. So I'm thinking, this is like in February when I got that news. So I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, people are not going to be interested in this anyway, um, because people are going to be much more concerned about their own physical health and well-being, and COVID is going to take over everything. Um, and so I, I was sad. I really, I was very sad about this. I thought, well, I wrote the book, you know, I like, I, you know, I, it's okay. It was a good effort, et cetera. Well, then... George Floyd was murdered. And again, the universe opened up and this, this book has been, could not have been more timely, um, could not have been more relevant and continues to be. And as it turns out, because I've written a second book, a follow-up to this one, which will be published in uh, November, and in the research, I, I learned that, that racism and xenophobia increase historically during disease outbreaks. And haven't we seen that? We are, we are seeing it. We are absolutely watching and observing that. And so the second book is really more about how to apply what I'm writing about in the first book. More specifically, how do I apply these practices to specific issues associated with race-based stress and trauma. Um, so that's how these books came to be. Ozzy, I don't know if you have any questions that you wanna ask me about the contents about more, or if I should yeah. just do that. Okay. I'll, I'll ask a follow-up question. So for folks who haven't read the book, definitely read it if you haven't check it out from our library or um jen put a chat or a, a link to the a website to buy the book um for those who haven't read the book how would you not only what would you like them to know about it but what are some of these physiological psychological impacts of race-based stress stress and trauma and then what are different ways or strategies that you've learned from not only your own personal practice but from your work with other folks um, and how people heal from that okay. So 
uh, as a psychologist, as I said, I was in private practice for many, many years. My, my psychotherapy practice was always, I always had a 60, 40 uh, ratio, uh, racial mix. I never, it was sometimes 60% white, 40% black, uh, or other people of color, sometimes the reverse. I never tried to make that happen. That's just sort of the way my life has unfolded. And, you know, that, that's just the way it is. That's what I attract. So um, I, I knew I had, I had begun to actually teach restorative yoga to my private uh, therapy clients. Uh, toward the end, because they were really interested, and and I knew it had profound healing abilities, and so we would we would get together once a week in my office on Sundays. Those people who were in, you know, because people aren't coming to psychotherapy to to learn about yoga, they're not. So I, I always stayed in my lane. But for the people who had an interest, um, we we met weekly, and um, again, it was it was always a racially mixed group of people. And so nobody was coming to deal with, nobody came and said, and now I want to do yoga for race-based stress and trauma. No one's doing that. I mean, it's not, that's not how it works. <laughs> but I knew because I could tell by the impact of the practice, how healing it was. I'll give you an example. There, I was teaching a, a class. I never taught public classes, but I happened to be teaching a public class this one particular time I was invited to do it. And I knew many of the people there, but I didn't know everyone there, but there was one. So everybody is in, for those of you who don't practice yoga, everybody, we were all laying flat on our backs. I was not, the students were. And we're doing some deep relaxation exercises when a dog <laughs> ran into the room. And because the owner of the studio allowed dogs to come, allowed her students to bring dogs in. Anyway, so the dog runs in and runs right to the black woman from South Carolina who happened to be visiting. And she freaked out because I couldn't grab the dog before it got to her. Now I know, I know as a black person, that what dogs represent to black people currently and from our ancestral past. I know this, dogs were used to hunt black people. I know that a lot of black people love dogs. I understand that, but I also know that there's a deep visceral ancestral memory of being hunted by dogs. So the dog runs over, I grab the dog, get the dog out of the room, and this woman is like freaking out. She's terrified, absolutely terrified. So um, I, I did everything I could to, you know, calm the situation. And then I think the dog came back in and did the same thing. But at any rate, what she told me later was, she said, you know what? Because I, I couldn't apologize enough. She said, you know what? She said, what's interesting about this is I have been terrified of dogs my whole entire life. She said, and normally it would have taken me at least a month to get over that. She said, it took me about an hour to calm down about that. That's the transformative healing power of a practice that supports you in balancing your fight flight nervous system with your rest and digest, tend and befriend nervous system sympathetic, parasympathetic. So when both are online, this is the physiology of it. When both your sympathetic nervous system, the, the part of you that, that um, moves when you need to move and your parasympathetic nervous system, the part of you that can feel safe in stillness, when both are online, you're in what we call homeostasis, equilibrium. We're in a balanced state. And what that permits is it permits us to, to, the resilience is the ability to come back to that state of equilibrium after you have been uh, stressed or traumatized, put it that way. That's what, it doesn't keep you from being stressed or traumatized, but it supports the ability 
to move back and forth between those states as necessary. Does that make sense? We need that. We tend to be, here's my theory, and it is a theory because there's no research on this, but this is my, but here's the other thing. As far as research is concerned, I'm gonna read you something from the book in a minute about our mental health. We, you know, we have learned, I think we, many of us have learned and internalized there's something wrong with me. What race-based traumatic stress injury tells us is it is not the same as PTSD. Post-traumatic stress disorder is, a, is regarded as a pathological disorder. Pathological meaning it is, it is a disorder. There's something wrong with you because, you, even, because you've had a traumatic experience that happened in the past and you haven't yet been able to process it and recover from it. And therefore we will treat you so that you can learn to get over whatever trauma you have experienced. That's a, a, a very, um, that would be PTSD for the watered down version of it. I'll put it that way. I don't, I was gonna say for idiots, but I know there are no idiots here, but you know what I mean, it's, it's a joke. Um, so that's PTSD, race-based traumatic stress injury, which is a theory that was researched and developed by Robert Carter, a professor uh, at Columbia University. A race-based traumatic stress injury says that it is, it is an adaptive response to an external event that caused emotional pain. In other words, it is the ouch factor. It is the emotional ouch associated with, oh, that hurt. And it is normal. It is not pathological. It is normal to feel hurt when your feelings are hurt. And we know, and the experience is we know that it's valid because why? Because you're having it. So this is what, this is what yoga also teaches us, that it is our experiential reality that makes something valid and real, not evidence-based research, which is the Western approach to everything. Well, have, has it been researched? So here's my theory. My theory is based on, based on what I've seen, what I've experienced, and what my studies tell me. When you are dealing with people who are overworked, stressed out, and on high alert most of the time because you have to be, because you're living in a racialized culture that is hostile toward you. We need rest. We need, what we need is to learn how to feel safe in stillness, how to turn off that hyper alert, that hyper vigilant aspect of self and come to a place of rest. Now that sounds like it make, it, it sounds like it makes sense. It makes sense to me. But here's the thing, when you are on high alert most of the time, always scoping for danger, which is what the nervous system does, this is not a choice. Your nervous system does that. It's always scoping for danger. When you are on high alert all the time, you don't necessarily feel safe in stillness. You don't feel safe resting. You have to learn to experience a sense of safety if I'm not doing something, if I'm not ready to, you know, move, if I'm not ready to fight or get away from something. So it takes a lot of, it takes, it, it takes courage to be still. It does, you know, it does. It takes courage to be still, but it's within that stillness that the healing occurs. And that's what I write about in the book. But I want to talk about, I, I, I thought I would read. Do I have time to read something? I'm going to invite the other. I don't have to. Uh, well, I'll invite the other panelists if anyone would like to respond to anything that Dr. Dale has shared so far or would like to, oh, let's see if I did that right. Um, or would like to add on to um, the question around what are some of the ways that you all help your, how do you treat the own, your own racial stress and trauma or how you center that in the work that you do? Yeah. 
Mm. I feel as if I definitely relate and resonate a lot with what Dr. Gail Parker was mentioning in regards to how we have to really emphasize the space of rest, although we feel unsafe in body. And so within my, my therapy practice, I, I tend to work with a lot of queer Black femmes um, and navigating safety, right? And we have to understand like systems don't make us safe. And so how can we navigate inner safety? Um, so we are able to then like bring in that ease and that rest because I just know myself, um, I was talking about last semester, I taught eight courses. I was just like, let me just OD myself because I'm sitting in the corner of my apartment for COVID. Um, as I was then attempting to talk to my clients about, hey, rest, be easy. Black women don't need to produce, right? As I'm not doing anything but producing and pushing and going and going, right? And so um, I think over these, especially the last like two months since school's been out, really kind of thinking about what that looks like, not only in my own personal life, but then how am I able to, my therapist, she said, you create flows, you don't know how to go with the flow. And I was like, you can get out of my business. And also, right, mm -hmm. uh, that's true. <laughs> There's so much truth there, right? Around like, wow, I have truly been creating so many flows because black women are so used to producing and the flows that have been there haven't felt good for my body, right? And like, how can I navigate more in my body so that flow is just more at ease versus me trying to like raft another way. Um, so yeah, absolutely, thank you. I would add that uh, as Dr. Parker was sharing and Jaleesa, what you were just saying just reminded me of the wisdom of the teens that um, honored me with sharing their uh, story. So I did uh, qualitative research asking black teens in DC how they define trauma and how they define healing. And as they talked about uh, healing from the types of traumas that they um, experienced in their communities, uh, they shared some beautiful wisdom that resonates with a lot of stuff that I've heard from elders or heard um, from people who talk about body work and um, body centering. And so they described, you know, that if a black team maybe saw someone get shot, for example, that, you know, while we might, you know, be in that conversation and anticipate devastation and falling out and, you know, needing certain versions of things to find support, they talked about going to listen to music. And um, they talked about using their experiences with grief and community uh, mourning as a framework for understanding, you know, how to process and respond uh, to things that they classified as trauma. But something that was really rich and beautiful was how they talked about acceptance, right? And so when they defined trauma, they talked about trauma uh, sometimes as a rite of passage in the sense that they knew that there were things that were gonna happen in life. And they knew that there were particular things that they were going to experience in their communities because of their identities, because of their blackness, um, because of the way that um, it just, layers of isms impacted them and the families and ancestors before them. And so they described that they had framed, you know, their experience of life as I'm going to have these things, these events are going to be here. And I know that healing is about the po possibility of growing through whatever that thing is that I confront. And they had models that they were able to identify within the community that they would go to, you know, I know that there's been somebody else here who's gone through this. So my healing journey is about going and talking to them. And then about acceptance, they would say so powerfully, you know, in ways that people like to colorfully write articles about mindfulness, they just said so simply and powerfully that, you know, healing is about acceptance, you know, me getting to the space where I know that I can't bring this person back, you know, I know that the images of, you know, the flashbacks of whatever I saw, I know that, you know, I can't change, you know, the fact that those things happen and I experienced them. Uh, but through what uh, presented to me as this idea of radical acceptance, that they had the ingredients for settling their bodies, you know, through listening to music, you know, th identifying music as a strategy for supporting them on the other side of a traumatic event, they know the truth about needing to settle in the spaces in their bodies that are triggered and, you know, hyperactive in uh, response to the things that they went through. So it was really beautiful to hear you know, from them and to, you know, make those connections as you, as you all were talking. I 
I'm sitting with the, the conversation about um, what Dr. Henderson was just speaking of, of how we settle into our bodies. Um, my favorite concept is Neti Akotafor's uh, going a Lucy, right? When trauma occurs, this concept that we escape our bodies. Um, some of our communities might call that sustos or soul loss. And I think about the ways and the strategies that we move towards to get back in. And one of those portals is through the earth. Um, and food as the embodiment of that portal and as the embodiment as that relationship to the earth. Um, I'm glad to hear that these young people are using music because a lot of us will use food to eat and to soothe those emotions. Um, and as a practitioner of nourishment-based healing, I be with many, many people who lay right with sugar right, who go to the sweet thing to help them settle back down. Um, and what I've learned from that practice is that there's nothing wrong with the sweet thing. Sweet is the flavor. It's the very first flavor that we have um, because we, it's the, the taste of our mother's milk, right? And so we have things like dairy and like sugar, but when we consume them, they actually ferment to opioids right, in our stomachs. And those opioids do sometimes the opposite of what we wanted. Instead of grounding down back into our bodies, right, we escape again. Um, and so I'm thinking about the conversation, Dr. Parker, of resting and digesting and how these processes of resting and digesting, but literally the digesting part, can actually move us towards a better regulated, um, a better regulated emotional response. Um, and another thing that you said, you said that awareness is the medicine of healing. And I love that so much. Um, and so what I encourage for those folks who move towards earth flavored foods um, is to move towards them with awareness. Um, the other thing that we lost as Black folks was the ability to develop our food culture in a sovereign nature. And so our foods are a mishmash of what our ancestors decided would be a perfect substitute, like uh, cocoa yams for sweet potatoes, right? Um, and so we do have beautiful food technologies, but what I'm noticing um, is that because our senses have been overrun with someone else's idea of flavor. Uh, when we do move to our food um, for the respite that we need, um, the lack of consciousness causes us to disconnect again. And so um, thinking about the strategies that we use, I would you know, encourage folks to change their relationships or really change the way they're eating the foods um, into a restful, meditative way. My favorite portal back into my body is taste. So what would it be like to take that bowl of ice cream and sit with it and taste every sensation that it creates? Sometimes the stuff knows, right? Like whatever it is that's happening, like what would it be like to slow down and have restfulness in our eating? Um, and so I'm thinking about the portals that we're using and the ways that our portals are not wrong. Um, and I understand the way that like fear around diet and fat phobia will force us to like cram the sweet things, but what would it be like? Um, what would it be like to eat it restfully? And so as I'm sitting here with all these wonderful therapists, um, I'm also thinking about the ways that we intuitively know how to heal. Um, and the thing that we need as Jaleesa spoke is, is space to just be where we are not rushing to eat our food we could just sit with it um so those are the things that are that are coming to my mind in response to all that you all have shared um and i just wanted to add that so 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 beautiful all of those words and i see that we're <laughs> we're running out of time um I'm wanting to hear more about the role of community in healing. I think we've talked about 
some of the internal work that you all have experienced or that you've seen witness. I, I want to hear more about how do we practice internal healing, individual healing alongside collective healing and what is the role of community um, in supporting our individual healing? Whoever wants to take that. I'll just say really quick. Oh, sorry. sorry no, sorry. no, Zulika, go ahead, please. I was just gonna say really quickly connected to what we were talking about in rest. Um, so recently I was invited to uh, a, a spiritual community that meets virtually on, on Tuesdays. And so each uh, month we have a different theme and one month the uh, theme was rest. And so the practice we did that day was actually get on Zoom and rest in community. Mm -hmm. And there was something so beautiful about being on these screens, laying down like right over here and, you know, giving ourselves permission as a collective to say that rest is, you know, welcomed here, that rest is medicine here and that we will transform together our relationship of how we, you know, welcome rest and where uh, where rest is relegated, you know, that rest is not just something that you need to wait for night in the bed to happen, but that rest is actually an act of resistance and it is a necessary, um, you know, process to, you know, just to, to support our healing and well being all around. And so that idea of resting in community together was just beautiful and brilliant. And it was a way to hold each other without saying anything or doing anything. Uh, for reminding us is like, oh, we, we all need this and we can have it together. So just wanted to share that. And another way of saying that is that rest is our superpower. It really is. Um, but we, but see, we have, we, we have to honor the fact that we have blocks to resting because if you take, if you go all the way back to enslavement, see, it's, it's more than we just are busy, 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 busy. That's part of it. But our lives were literally endangered if we rested. We carry that in us. That's in us. And so when we rest, a lot of things come up that can be scary, which is why doing this in community is so important or with skilled facilitators so that we can tolerate the discomfort of, of releasing the toxins that's what that is, by the way, as we remain still and just observe. Now that, that, I mean, that that's easier said than done, but that's the work. It is, it's, it's what Asia said. What if we just ate restfully? What if we did everything with ease? What if we did, what if we made ease our priority? So you can still get a lot done with ease. My mother used to say, if there's a hard way to do something, Gail will find it. It was true. And I thought that working hard was the same as doing my best. It is not. It is not. Those are two very different things. Doing your best and working hard are not the same. So I advocate for taking the easy way out. And I mean that Michelle Obama said in her book, Becoming, she said, I learned to march to the beat of unending effort with a willingness to tolerate misery to achieve a goal. How many of you can relate to that? That's in our DNA. Every single one of us was taught, show, you gotta be 200% better to be considered equal. You gotta do twice as much to be half as good. That's in us. That needs to be healed. Excellence is not the same as being, is, is working yourself to death. It's not. We can be excellent restfully, can't we? <laughs> Multitasking is overrated. It is. It is. Can I read, can I read one thing? I was just going to ask okay. in our last five minutes if you would like to close us out with a, an excerpt. I would, it's, and it's related to what everybody said. And Dr. Henderson, um, the kind of research you're talking about is the kind of research that needs to be done. You know what I mean? Where you, you go into the community, ask the people, what, what, what do you, what, what does healing mean to you? That's the kind of research that needs to be done. Okay, so this is a, a uh, this is on page one twenty two in the book. It's under um, 
our cultural conditioning, shining a light on cultural conditioning uh, so that we recognize how that influences us. So this is on, under mental health. Approaches to supporting mental health and well being are not universal, but are influenced by our culture. Writer Andrew Solomon was curious about various ways different cultures dealt with depression. So he went uh, on a search to find out. He shared a story about a conversation he had with a Rwandan based on how they treated depression after the genocide of 1994. He learned that when Western mental health workers arrived after the, after the genocide to help the survivors recover, the Rwandans had to ask some of them to leave. The Western mental health approach to healing was to take people individually into what was described as a dingy little room and have them talk about the bad things the survivors had experienced. In Rwandan culture, that was considered to be a destructive approach. The Rwandan approach to healing, trauma and depression involved a ritual that included the entire community. Everyone would take the day off to be outdoors in the sun with drummers and people dancing together to get the life force flowing, to lift each other up and to return one another to joy. To them, depression was regarded as something invasive and external that could be cast out, not something internal that needed to be cured. We know that intuitively, don't we? Uh -huh. That's who we are. That's who we are. Doesn't mean that we can't use help. We, 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 know, we know that we can use help, but it's critically important for us to do it from our own awareness and internalized experience of what we know we need. Now, it's what someone else is telling us we need. You typical, yes, yes. Yes, 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 yes to all of that. Thank you all for sharing your wisdom, your light, your energy, your love, and your presence with us today. The panelists and the the attendants, the attendees. Um, this has been such a rich conversation that I will definitely rewatch. I want to, before we close, quickly plug some things in case you want to stay engaged with the work of these wonderful women. This is. Dr. Gail Parker's website, you can find her on IG at that. You can find Jalisa, you can reach out to Jalisa via her email here. You can reach out to Dr. Zalika Henderson here. Um, she also has a really great publication, a couple of publications on post-traumatic growth, which is actually how I found her work. Um, and I will share, Asia didn't give this to me to share, but I'm gonna share it anyways. I subscribe to Asia's Patreon. She's got some wonderful, wonderful things on there. And I definitely encourage you to support her writing and to support her magic through that. Um, Dr. Parker mentioned that there is a black yoga conference that's going to be online in August. So I'm going to plug that as well. Um, and I see some folks from Soda Soul Sisters. So I'm going to go ahead and plug that as well. And so Soda Soul Sisters is a faith-based, racial justice-oriented, Black femme-led group here that does a lot of really dope programming um, for women, trans, non-binary, queer. Um, they do a lot of doula work. They do a lot of self-care work. And every month they've got a self-care Saturday. Next month, it's going to be on play with Talea, who's also in the house. And I've already bought my ticket, so you should as well. Um, and that's a way to continue having these conversations, to continue connecting with folks, especially Black women who are leading this work and are equally passionate about this. So thank you all for attending. I will, if any panelist wants to say one last thing before we wrap up, I'll go ahead and allow for that. Otherwise, I want to be mindful of folks' time. Thank you all for giving us an hour and a half of your time. You could have spent an entire day, I'm sure, um, maybe next time. <laughs> I'll let you all have a last word. Somebody asked in the chat about yoga teach black yoga teacher training, and I think Satya Yoga, which is in Denver, mm -hmm. uh, is the place to go. Yeah. Asia, you want to speak a little bit to Satya? Yeah, for sure. And I know Jalisa has also been touched by our beloved leader, Lakshmi Nair, and the way that our yoga teacher trainer 
training works is that we use the chakras to address the traumas. And so you get to go into each, uh, each chakra and learn how to heal what's there through that lens. And it's an amazing innovation. And so I thoroughly encourage you to follow Satya Yoga on Instagram. Um, and definitely think about the yoga teacher training is life changing. And a lot of you here have, have also been transformed by it. So do, do join uh, our co-op. And it was the first what? It's the first <laughs> uh, yoga teacher. It's the first yoga co-op uh, owned by, run by people of color in the nation. Um, and so please support us. Just like this is the first yeah. book of its kind like this, y'all. I don't under I don't know if you understand, but you are in the presence of history. Like I think this is gonna set the precedence for how yoga is taught in a lot of ways. And so to be in the company of someone who is at the forefront of that is a huge honor. So buy the book, check it out, tell your friends, create community practices to integrate the book, and definitely, definitely, definitely continue on this conversation. Jalisa or Zaleika, do you have any last words? I just share really quickly. So the universe has invited me to be the founding director of a center for black well-being here in New York City. And that center is all of ours. So uh, the email address that Ozzy put in the chat, Z Henderson at Gray Matters uh, MD.com is where you can find me. But please be on the lookout because it'll be a way where we're not starting from the beginning trying to explain to other people why we need to center what we know. It is building on those things and creating wellness. Uh, that is aligned with who we are. So please be wow. on the lookout for the Center for Black Well-Being at Great Matters. I always got to go behind on everybody that's doing all these cool things, right? Um, I am, I'm actually in this, like, I have so much love and light and appreciation for this space. Um, the universe got me in a transformation at this time. So I am, like, transitioning from teaching so much like yoga mindfulness uh, classes and I am preparing to apply for PhD programs y'all so send me some love some light so we can start getting some research done and elevating uh, these conversations and spaces they need you know so thank you oh, and on that note thank you all I'm sending you so much love energy and soft yellow light I hope you take this feeling that you're feeling today and you go in and spread it and continue leaning into that because this can be cultivated at any time um, by doing self-reflection, by having these conversations, by reading books like this. Um, so definitely go ahead and continue doing that and we will be in touch. Take care, everyone. Thank you.